welcome everyone today we'll be exploring an essay titled gender bias in theater and performing arts male gaze bioessentialism inclusion now this essay is uh, by meghna banjan and this text is prescribed in your ability enhancement course uh, titled literature language and performing arts now this is a very significant topic it basically talks about gender inclusivity in theater and we all know that theater has the incredible power to tell stories it reflects our society and sparks important conversations but did you know that it often has a history of leaving out many voices especially those of women and other marginalized groups so today through this essay we'll explore how the ideas of male gaze bioessentialism and inclusion shape the stories we see on stage now the goal or the objective of this essay is not just to create a more women centric drama or women centric plays but to create a space for all voices okay including marginalized genders marginalized individuals uh, coming from different backgrounds so uh, this essay is trying trying to state that art especially in the case of uh, this essay it talks about theater drama which is a performing art okay so such art forms are not for any particular gender or any particular community it is it should be an all inclusive space it should include the voices the uh, artistry of uh, people belonging to all backgrounds okay so now let us explore it uh, more closely now theater is a form of art that people use for various purposes including entertainment and protest it expresses human emotions and ideas from love and passion to protest and dissent people have used the stage to speak about injustice to challenge the status quo to share their personal or collective experiences etc even in the realm of gender expression theater has played an important role it has offered a space uh, where artists assume characters and speak out freely and frankly about the many uh, follies and foibles in society and when we look into the modern times we can see a division in how theater is perceived and performed on one side we have the elite theaters like the broadway or other larger ones and they have often become associated with the upper class the upper class uh, go there and watch a uh, place but on the other side we also have street plays or nukkad nataks as they are known in hindi these plays are performed in public places often in lo- local communities and they serve a dual purpose they entertain but they also protest and give voice to the concerns of the oppressed so we can see that theater is a space or theater is an art form which has the potential to include all voices but in reality when we look deeper into that art form we understand that it hasn't always been truly inclusive especially when it comes to representation and accessibility and this has been especially true for women women have historically been underrepresented in theater and when they have appeared their portrayals have often been neither accurate nor authentic okay and a great example the author cites of this is kathakali the traditional dance drama from kerala 
and it is known for its elaborate costumes theatrical expressions etc and you see for the longest time women were not allowed to perform in kathakali at all female characters were played exclusively by men while women were confined to do their roles within the home they they couldn't uh, uh, appear on stage they were not allowed to appear on stage it was the men who took the characters who played the characters of women uh, characters as well however recently there has been a lot of resistance to such traditions and today we are starting to see more women uh, more women taking their rightful place on the kathakali stage now let's look and see what exactly is the reason for such under representation of women see the author finds that for centuries theater has been dominated by men and when i talk about theater uh, this is applicable also in cinema okay men write the scripts they direct the plays they take center stage when in case of uh, films uh, the cinematography the dop director of photography uh, the technical side almost everything of this is done by men and as a result even if it is in cinema or in drama we see that the stories and characters have been shaped by a male perspective okay because these stories are written by a male so it is their perspective of women that we get the story is not written by a woman we don't get the woman's perspective of woman but we get a male perspective of a uh, woman and you look at the uh, case of cinema there also the same issue persists it is through the camera man's uh, angle of vision that a woman is uh, shown so it is the male eyes that sees or captures the female or the female body okay so this is called the male gaze so the male gaze refers to the way in which women their stories and their experiences have been portrayed from a male point of view often reinforcing certain stereotypes or reducing women to certain roles now this male gaze has become so ingrained in theater and other art forms that it has created a major challenge for both women and men so in order to overcome it people must actively strive against this um, internalized sexism and misogyny that have been part of the art form for example there is a well known essayist and literary critic called vivian forester and she explains this idea beautifully when she discusses the difficulty of seeing the world through women's eyes she says we don't know what women's vision is what do women's eyes see how do they carve invent decipher the world i don't know i know my own vision the vision of one woman but the world seen through the eyes of others i know only what men's i see see that is what she says yes that is truth even if it is through films or through drama we envision a woman or we see a woman as written by the director as envisioned by that male director or we see a woman in cinema uh, as uh, she is envisioned by that camera man okay so we 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 really don't know what a woman thinks about a woman or how will it be if a woman writes about a woman or if a woman portrays a character of a woman 
okay so in short our understanding of the world the woman's understanding of the world through theater literature and other forms of art has largely been shaped by what men see and not what women see this means we still have a long way to go in terms of creating that equal and inclusive spaces in theater we should create a space where women's voices women's experiences and women's perspectives are given the same weight and importance as men's okay next the author mekana bhajan cites a recent study conducted by the european theater convention etc and this study was titled gender equality and diversity in european theaters now this study sheds light on the current state of gender representation in theater and their findings were quite revealing they found that for every 6 men mentioned in theater programs only 4 women are at least noted okay so this means the 6 men mentioned in those theater programs they might be uh, top stars but compared to them only a few women were noted at least noted they they don't have that uh, star status and everything those women actors uh, they are just noted their performance are noted that's it okay so this disparity extends beyond just recognition and it is evident in the roles of playwrights directors and technical staff in all these fields it is men who outnumber women significantly be it playwrights the people who write the drama be it directors who direct the shows or technical staff in all these roles it is men who outnumber women and then the study uh, found that women often dominate specific other roles such as hairdressing or uh, costumer now these jobs are often viewed as feminine jobs and perhaps are considered easier or less significant okay so uh, such perspectives contributes to the stereotype that uh, these jobs or these so called feminine jobs are more suited for women okay and when we look at the number of women directing plays the figures are very low the figures are strikingly low even if you take local examples or international ones so this brings up important questions like is it really a lack of talent among women directors or uh, is there uh, an amount of conscious gender discrimination present in both local and global theater communities okay so the author finds that studies like the one conducted by the european theater convention which focuses on gender equality and diversity in european uh, theaters such studies highlight a critical issue in the theater industry regarding gender equality so as we move forward it is essential to challenge these stereotypes and advocate for greater representation of women in all roles within theater uh, not just hairdressers or costume costumers uh, but uh, there should be uh, women representation in all roles within theater or even in cinema okay next let us look at the historical context of gender representation in theater see feminist theater began to emerge as a powerful movement during the 1970s and it aimed at telling more stories of women and improving how gender is portrayed in the arts so this feminist theater or this movement they have worked to challenge those stereotypes and destabilize the male gaze and in order to understand the roots of this issue we can look back at the origins of western theater in ancient greece and rome 
Greek theatre began its tradition of tragic plays around 532 BC. Now, during this time, women were seen as inferior to men and they were not allowed to participate in theatre or other performing arts. It was believed that women performing on stage was dangerous. So instead, men played both male and female characters. The Greeks thought that having men portray women would neutralize this danger. Now this was uh, happening even during the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. Especially in England, we have examples of Shakespearean plays. During those times, during the 16th century, which you consider as the golden age of golden age of uh, English drama, it was the time of William Shakespeare. Even at that time, uh, when the plays were performed on stage, it was young boys who took on the role of females. Okay, so uh, there also we can see the uh, gender inequality on stage. So when you look at the Romans, they also held similar views about women, making it very difficult for them to appear on stage. But as time went on, some Roman plays started to include a few female actors. So this signaled a small shift in this attitude. So now we have analyzed the history behind this issue. So, we can see that a form of socio-psychological conditioning influences the theatre landscape. And this is the reason why there is a gender disparity. Okay, And what is this socio-psychological conditioning? It means, you see, theatre, it is a reflection of society. Okay, And our society is largely sexist. So it is fair to conclude that gender and gender roles play a significant role in the inequalities we see in the performing arts. Because whatever gender inequality we see in society, whatever sexist perspectives we see in society, that is reflected onto stage, that is reflected onto cinema, that is reflected on, onto uh, other art forms. Okay. But sometimes this marginalization may not be deliberate. But it is the internalized gender bias. Internalized means something that is there in our mind. Society consists of people. And people have this sexist perspective. That men are superior and women are inferior. So this internalized gender bias becomes evident when it comes to creating uh, such art forms. But there are many works uh, which have challenged uh, this sort of gender inequality in representation. A notable example is the street play Aurat by Safdar Hashmi. And this play was uh, staged in 1979. And this play highlighted critical issues like Sati, the practice of a widow uh, jumping onto her husband's funeral pyre. And uh, another issue that the play addressed was dowry system. So through, uh, through this play, the dramatists were able to uh, bring to the public's attention such gender uh, uh, problematic issues. Another important work is named Mitrachi Goshta. It was released in 1981 and it was by the playwright Vijay Tendulkar. And it was one of the uh, first Indian plays to explore lesbian relationships. And you should see that it was uh, staged during 1981. At that time, uh, such topics were not openly discussed or it was considered as taboo topics, this lesbian, gay relationship, etc. But Vijay Tendulkar showed the courage to uh, uh, depict uh, such a very controversial topic uh, through his play. But 
compared to many contemporary plays this play by vijay tendulkar did not fully represent the experiences of lesbian women but it suggestively showed that itself was revolutionary then we have mahashweta devi the very famous bengali writer she has uh, written five landmark plays like mother of mother of 1084 it is about the naxal movement next is ajir which is about uh, which is a story of a slave named patan and his ancestors had signed a bond of slavery so because of this bond he is denied the right to love and marry okay that is the story of ajir then there is urvashi o johnny uh, it is a play which talks about the pathetic existence of homeless uh, people and then there was uh, the most discussed byen and it is a play about superstition about social injustice and the marginalized role of women in indian society and finally water uh, is a play which explores the challenges of accessing water in the village of charsa it talks about the themes of discrimination oppression and marginalization of a community so over the years theater festivals and workshops in india and around the world uh, have started to focus on women centric issues and these issues have uh, these initiatives have begun to challenge the male gaze even if only slightly but there is uh, at least a beginning uh, for giving more importance to the female perspective so towards the end of this essay the author tells us that when we talk about concepts like male gaze female gaze etc it is important to avoid falling into a bio essentialist perspective Now what is bio essentialism this simply means we shouldn't assume that gender is strictly tied to biology as this can limit our understanding of gender identity and experiences so i've given a definition uh, in this context of bio essentialism it is the idea that biological differences such as sex and reproductive functions strictly define and determine a person's identity okay that means a person's identity is not defined solely based on a person's sex or reproductive functions okay so sex is a biological indicator right we uh, fill in the forms whether we belong to the male sex or the female sex right and a male as well as a female has also reproductive functions so all this encompasses the biological aspects of uh humans but apart from that there is something beyond biology that defines what a man is or what a woman is it includes our uh thoughts our feelings our experiences many other things right okay so bioessentialism means it is the idea that biological differences such as sex and reproductive functions strictly define and determine a person's identity roles and experiences so this perspective often limits the understanding of gender by reducing it into biological factors and it ignores the complexity and diversity of gender identities and experiences beyond biological definition so that is what i said beyond biology there are many other things that define uh, our gender or our identity or our personality okay it is not only the gender that defines me but it is also the experiences my thoughts my perspectives my outlook many many other things that indicate what i am that define what i am okay so we have to avoid 
this sort of bioessentialism that means simply linking gender to biology here the author cites uh, an example uh, from a web series which was adapted which has been adapted uh, from a play of the same name uh, fleabag that's the name of that web series and in that now this fleabag this uh, web series or the play it was very famous for its feminist perspectives but our author meghna uh, she says that there is a particular monologue in this play or in this web series by a character named belinda okay and this is a soliloquy on menstruation or and uh, menopause now both are biological process of uh, of a woman's body so in this particular monologue she talks about uh, these two things menstruation and uh, menopause and it's about she speaks about how women have to deal with menstruation uh so for you to have a look at what that passage is all about i have just uh, included that in the slide uh this passage is not actually in the essay that we are discussing uh but i have taken it and pasted it so that you know what is the author talking about uh you may go through this passage that monologue by belinda it's about menstruation uh the difficulties that women have to undergo during both these process the menstruating process as well as the uh, uh process of menopause so here our author uh, meghna banjan she identifies this passage as a very bioessentialist passage because uh, she feels that uh here the character is equating woman with just these two process menstruation and uh, menopause nothing beyond that it's not that right so the author is asking how can you simply just associate women only with uh, such biological process isn't a woman beyond that isn't a woman or women's roles in family in society uh, or as a person as an individual does she, doesn't she contribute more uh, than just having being equated to gender i mean or biology and moreover now we are in a world or now we are in a uh, society which tries to be more inclusive now we understand that it is not the male and the female gender but we have other gender identities as well like transgender homosexuals many other gender identities as well so it is an all inclusive society so she says when we talk about or when we include such uh, examples through works we should try to uh, consider other gender identities as well see for example in this particular example of flea bag this monologue by belinda i told you that she is talking about menstruation or and menopause she is equating women just to these two things in this particular monologue okay but now our author asks what about women who menstruate but they don't consider them as women for example the transgenders there will be women physically biologically they might be having the uh, process that happens to a woman's body but mentally they will be identifying themselves as another gender okay so we should include such identities also so that is why she says even though this monologue is very famous it has gained a lot of attention in reality we should understand that not all menstruators identify themselves as women okay and not all women menstruate as well there are the transgenders who 
consider it vice versa for example they will have a male body but mentally they identify themselves as a female they don't menstruate okay on the other hand there are women uh, who has a female body who undergo this female process biological process of body but they identify mentally as a male so that is why she says not all menstruators identify themselves as women and not all women menstruate so we should include uh, such identities also so that is what our author suggests and not only it uh, pertains to uh, just gender we must be careful not to confine the female gaze to just a white upper class perspective we should also uh, think about other marginalized genders and individuals like bahujan women people from oppressed backgrounds uh, people from other communities uh, who are marginalized it's not the it's not a problem faced by the upper class women we should also consider the problems of other uh, women belonging to oppressed social classes okay so by doing this we can create a richer diverse and more authentic artistic landscape that truly reflects the the, the diversity of the human experience okay so that is this essay is all about